Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, thank you for being here and joining us for the Stand for Medicine, Building a Culture of Health Equity uh, monthly lecture series. My name is Terrence Mays and I am the Associate Dean for Equity and Strategic Initiatives here at Stand for Medicine and also our Executive Director of the Commission on Justice and Equity. The Building a Culture of Health Equity program is organized by Stanford Medicine's Office on Continuing Medical Education, or CME, uh, the Stanford Medicine Health Equity Action Leadership, or HIL Network, and the new Stanford Medicine REACH Initiative, Racial Equity to Advance a Community of Health. And this lecture series highlights education, research, uh, innovation that work towards ensuring all individuals receive equal priority and the highest level of care so that together we are building culture of health equity across our nation. Um, we're grateful again, once again, to have attendees at uh, this lecture series from all over the country. And today we are thrilled to have Mary Stutz as our distinguished Women's History Month speaker. Uh, and my colleague, Dr. Magali Fasciotto will introduce um, Mary in just a moment. But uh, first, I'd like to do just a little housekeeping. Uh, so we do invite you to use the Q&A uh, tool on Zoom uh, to submit a question for our speaker. We will have a Q&A session uh, right after the lecture. Please feel free to add your questions at any point uh, during the talk, and we will do our best to get to them during the Q&A period. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat function, and someone on our team will assist you. Um, also, in case you were unaware, we are hosting a one-day summit, um, building a culture of health equity summit on May 19th. Uh, the summit will explore health equity through the lenses of education, research, clinical care, uh, and community and civic engagement. Early bird uh, for the summit ends on April 21st if you'd like to register, uh, and there is no cost to register if you are a student. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Pasiota. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Mays. Uh, my name is Magali Fasciotto, and I serve as Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Stanford Medicine, and I'm here representing the Stanford Medicine HEAL Network. I have the distinct privilege today to introduce our phenomenal speaker. Um, I am honored to know her personally and to welcome her back to Stanford Medicine for what I know will be an incredible discussion as we celebrate Women's History Month. Mary Stutz is the Global Chief Inclusion and Health Equity Officer at Real Chemistry and a member of the company's executive leadership team. In this role, Stutz leads the company's comprehensive diversity, inclusion, and health equity strategy as brand enhancers and business growth levers. Stutz joins Real Chemistry having led corporate relations and ch championed DEI at some of the world's most prominent biotechnology pharmaceutical, healthcare, and media companies, including Genentech, Bristol Myers Squibb, Bayer, United Health Group, Kaiser Permanente, Stanford Healthcare, and Comcast NBC Universal. In January 2022, Stets led the convening of the inaugural Real Health Equity Summit, which brought together an intersectional and inclusive gathering of leaders from across the health ecosystem to elevate current and future solutions to health inequities. Among her many, many accomplishments, as the former Chief Inclusion, Diversity, and Health Equity Officer at Stanford Healthcare, Stutz curated the Inclusive Leadership Workshop designed to develop executives capable of leading and growing organizations while transforming to address racial and social injustice and inequity amongst all stakeholders. Additionally, Stutz led Genentech's $5 million diversity in clinical trials initiative to increase the representation of people of color and women, enhancing a culture of workplace DNI during Bristol Myers Squibb's business model transformation, 
and she oversaw the fulfillment of the FCC's DE&I conditions required for the approval of NBC Universal's acquisition of Comcast NBCU's California region. In January of 2022, again, Stutz curated the first real health equity summit, Changing Out Loud, during the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference, which convened healthcare providers and leaders from healthcare companies, academia, local community organizations, venture, and government to collaborate and drive long term change across the healthcare ecosystem. Stutz is also an accomplished author whose books include recurring themes of exclusion in the workplace, and the missing mentor, women advising women on power, progress, and priorities. Growing up as a foster child from the age of five led Stutz to form the Center for Excellence in Life, or TCEL, a 501c3 organization focused on developing underrepresented youth and women aspiring to leadership positions. TCEL's virtual internship program for underrepresented youth has received nationwide recognition and media coverage. Stutz earned a Master of Health Administration degree at the University of Southern California and is also a graduate of the Executive Program on Strategy and Organization at the Stanford University Graduate School of Business. You know, this is really an amazing bio for an amazing individual. And thank you so much for being here today and welcome, Mary Stutz. Thank you so much, Magalie. I am so sorry you had that long version. I don't know, <laughs> not sure who said that, but I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, but thank you so much for that introduction. And I am thrilled to be back at Stanford and to talk to everyone about uh, where we are today with health equity, with inclusion. Um, the goal really today is to explore the business and societal case for breaking the bias in the health ecosystem so that we really move the needle to advance health equity. We know that over the past few years, there have been so many calls for improving health equity and there have been massive commitments from organizations to actually fund um, and create initiatives to drive equal access to health and improved outcomes for everybody. But really, the needle has yet to move to significant change. And that's why for me, um, it is a continuation of work uh, that I started even, uh, well, at Kaiser, but then also at Genentech, where I, as you, as you heard, where I led the first diversity and clinical trials initiative for the industry, because this was above the brand. It wasn't for a particular product. It was, this is a major issue uh, for the industry. And quite frankly, we had gotten embarrassed at an FDA hearing when they asked us about the levels of diversity we had um, in, uh, in the first biologic asthma therapy. And, and uh, you know, they were like, that's a real issue in, <laughs> in the Black community and in the inner city. And how many people do you have in your child from the Black community? And it was eh, none. Uh, so we addressed that in the, in the phase fours. But the point is, it was a broader issue across the industry. And that's why we were able to lead that more as a social impact initiative, not a company initiative. And these are, and the reason I'm saying that is because these are the types of initiatives that we're going to need to move forward if we're really serious about moving the needle. It can't just be about our organization and certainly um, health equity, achieving health equity doesn't begin and end with uh, diversifying your clinical trial. There is so much more uh, that's involved in that. But I would say, as another proof point, the things that we found back then, which was, by the way, in 2007, which was that women and people of color were not uh, being offered the opportunity to participate in trials. Um, the specialists who are the gatekeepers were not offering them to women and people of color. And also diverse physicians were not being offered the opportunity to be investigators. And lo and behold, those are the same issues and statistics that we are seeing today. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the difficult conversations that need to take place to move the needle? What are the elephants in the room that have yet to be addressed in transparent, authentic, uh, you know, breakthrough thinking ways. Uh, what does systemic change really look like? And what is it going to take to make it happen? And who actually is in position to make it a reality? 
um, what is the impact of not diversifying the human genome database for an organization like Stanford, where personalized health precision medicine is kind of like our nirvana, can't get there if the human genome database is not diversified. So what is the impact and what are we doing to do that? Uh, what lessons can we learn from Operation Warp Speed? Why is decolonization, I know that makes some people uncomfortable, but that's what's required. Why is uh, decolonization and deconstructing of clinical trials and global health um, essential in order to move the needle? And, and what are some meaningful metrics to um, track our progress? These are all the kinds of things that we are looking at and how is it that you integrate your inclusion um, and your health equity work into your corporate, your industry, your community solutions that can fuel this, this innovation, that can build relationships and improve outcomes. So those are some of the questions that I would challenge us all to um, think about and to seek to answer. And I'm going to um, address some of the thinking around some of these in my presentation. So I am going to share my screen here. And I am going to jump into my presentation and you have seen that. So first of all, even if you look at um, just defining health equity, so many uh, people are using diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity um, as uh, you know the same thing, and they are not. So I think just very quickly, this is why we created this slide, just to help uh, folks that we're talking to about it, just to even understand about um, the differences. And, and what is kind of this inclusion and health equity anyway, and looking at it from the barriers and then our aspirational end state. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I, I would think most of the audience probably knows that, but certainly the barriers are the health and the healthcare disparities, you know, the differences in outcomes, of the quality uh, levels between the groups. That's the metric that we use to measure progress. And so then there are the actual health inequities. These are the structural or the institutional patterns that result in health and healthcare disparities. Um, and then there are the social inequities. So these equivalent uh, treatment and opportunity for members of different groups uh, within society, regardless of the individual distinctions of race, ethnicity, gender, social class, sexual orientation, or other characteristics. Um, and then there's the social and digital determinants of health. These are the conditions in which people are born, uh, grow, live, work, and age. And so these are coming more and more to the front. It used to just be social determinants, but we know the digital determinants are huge. You have to have access uh, to the internet, to broadband, uh, to be able to do anything now. Certainly kids can't even get an education without it. So these things are, are and as we move more with um, digital solutions, as we are trying to address health inequities, um, the digital determinants of health are huge. And then there's the diversity, equity, and inclusion, which has more to do with your work environment. This is what corporations are doing internally in their organizations where uniqueness is celebrated, everyone can thrive, people feel valued, celebrated, included. Um, and then the last two are really critical that they have access to the same opportunities as everyone else in the organization and that they're being treated fairly or the same as everyone else. So we know that there are really a lot of deliberate acts of exclusion happening in organizations and microaggressions, which by the way, the majority of microaggressions people of color experience on the job or at the hands of their immediate supervisor and their colleagues. So more work needs to be done to develop inclusive uh, leaders and to look at how our employees are being treated, especially our diverse employees and, and research and data has found that um, you are seeing women and LGBTQ employees are faring better than Black and Hispanic employees in the workplace in so many ways. So that's the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece that's not necessarily health equity. And then our aspirational state, of course, is health equity, where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And then the social justice piece, where everyone deserves equal economic, political, social rights, and opportunities. And I would say also deserve access 
um, to the latest uh, therapy. So these are the concepts that we have to take into account in order to meet people where they are on their inclusion and health equity journey. Um, and at, at my organization, Real Chemistry, we are a health, um, health innovation advisory firm. And we believe that it's not innovative unless it's inclusive. And um, we like to define, and my team and I like to define health equity in an even deeper way. It is the vehicle by which we can achieve greater quality of life and greater life expectancy for historically marginalized groups that lack it the most, because that's ultimately where we want to get and we need to make sure that, um, you know, that is our end goal. And if we can focus on that, it will help us realize the extent of what we need to do uh, to make this a reality for all populations. So just to give a, um, some more depth around how um, we are looking at this, uh, we believe in inclusive data we trust. And now that's kind of a, a, a little nod to something that folks have heard me say a lot. Uh, again, when I was at Genentech, the joke was our CEO, Art Levinson's motto was, in God we trust, all else must bring the data. So giving that nod to data, and I feel the same way, I would just say in inclusive data we trust because we understand that there are inequities and bias existing across the entire care uh, continuum and across the drug development ecosystem. So it's really going to be important for us to look at, um, you know, shifting the power dynamics instead of putting the onus on the patients to solve all the problems. It's really going to require systemic and structural change. It's going to require healthcare providers, nurses, entire healthcare ecosystem behavior shifts um, to and providing care differently. <clears throat> from the bench to the bedside, driving equitable health transitions. So what we know is that the bias and the inequities exist across the entire care continuum, uh, including the drug development ecosystem. So we know that even uh, when you look at research, that the, the data, AI, the algorithms, a lot of the underlying platforms uh, for the, the um, research that we're doing are built on European male bi biologies and genetics, and the uh, advanced technologies can actually exacerbate and create even more um, health inequities. So we need to look at that and understand that. And even as you get to providers, um, we know that the providers play a huge role in whether uh, people get access and the truth of the matter is that people most trust people who look like them. And so the need to diversify our healthcare provider workforce um, and including the rest of the healthcare worker workforce is really critical. And we need to make sure that we are able to um, work with the providers and look at whether providers are, are offering the same things to their uh, diverse patients to the diverse populations. Um, we, we know from more recent data that people really trust their primary care physician of all the providers. They trust their primary care physicians, um, regardless of the ethnicity or the race of that primary care physician, uh, they, they have a greater relationship with that person. So we need to look at, are there ways for us to do more through the primary care model to um, reach our patients and to address and advance the needle on health equity. Um, we understand uh, from the clinical perspective, there's a lot of bias in the site selection, as we said, with the investigator criteria, the clinical trial protocols, uh, providing conclusive measures so that we are enrolling underrepresented populations and keep them in, their in the trials. So we know that there is bias because the providers are not offering, as I've said earlier, clinical trials to diverse uh, patients and to a certain extent to women, unless it is a specific uh, women's health initiative, but even then women of color are not being offered uh, the opportunity to participate in those trials um, by, their, by the specialists. And primarily the specialists are the gatekeepers. And as we said, 
even when you get through uh, the whole research piece, when you get your trial done and you get your drug approved by the FDA, uh, the research has also shown there's a lot of bias in the commercial process where again, the specialists are not necessarily offering uh, the latest therapies to uh, and most innovative therapies to people of color. I have a slide further on that summarizes uh, Dr. Janet Woodcock's participation in our summit uh, where she talked about the priorities um, for the FDA to advance health equity. And we know that there are some real challenges there. So understanding where the bias is, and again, it's all the way through research, it's through the providers, uh, through the clinical process, through the commercial launches and marketing and post-launch campaigns. And so we're looking at, are there applications and platforms um, and partnerships that we can create that would actually help us um, um, address the bias, remove the bias, bring more um, um, equity and equitable uh, approaches and more diversity to our work all the way across. And we need partnerships across the ecosystem to really integrate the inclusion and health equity um, offerings all the way across the process. So our concept is called uh, Rooted, and this is an um, end-to-end -end health equity engagement model. It applies what we're calling our fit-for-purpose solutions from clinical to community to help improve health outcomes for all by designing more inclusive and just systems. So our framework is based upon practices that are rooted in anti-racism, trauma-informed care, the digital and the social determinants of health, as I mentioned, but also the social inequities, the cultural responsiveness. Um, and that's something where we really need to go deeper on culturally appropriate responses and how we're showing up uh, in uh, communities and in organizations. This whole community first engagement where we are letting uh, the communities guide us in how to um, advance health equity there. And then this patient centricity approach where the patient is at the center of everything that we do. And we need evidence-based behavior change. And by the way, the behavior change again is across the whole ecosystem and it's two way. It's not just the patients that need to change. We need to change. Healthcare providers need to change. Our systems need to change. And then the intersectionality of it all, we've got to bring uh, together these, what we call non-traditional partnerships, but there has got to be uh, this intersection uh, when we come to solutions of academia, as well as the community, as well as corporations and governments and public policy makers, and venture capitalists, um, there are so many intersections that we want to make sure we are bringing together. And um, I do want to, again, we're talking specifically about addressing and breaking the bias and advancing healthcare. So the trauma-informed care is huge. And I do wanna take a moment to talk about this a little bit more because it gets to the root of the behavior change that is needed and trauma-informed care goes hand in hand with the anti-racism, with the cultural responsiveness, with the patient centricity, with the evidence-based behavior change. And I know uh, that Dr. Maybank and Dr. Jones talked a lot about the structural racism and the need to address that. But I would just uh, reiterate, it should come as no surprise that people of color experience different and unequal treatment within the US healthcare system. Most of the provider networks in the country lack the diversity that's needed to deliver truly culturally concordant and equitable care. Uh, the other thing is that, so we understand that um, creating that workforce for the future, you'll hear me reference that repeatedly, but future-proofing your workforce and doing what's necessary around uh, creating a diverse workforce is going to be critical and you have to start earlier than when uh, you know the diverse folks are in medical school because first of all not enough of them even make it to that point to address the broad need across this country let alone globally so we have to start earlier uh, with preparing that workforce and uh, and engaging and doing partnerships even at the middle school level is what you're seeing a lot of companies that are really at the forefront of addressing health equity they're starting uh, that early that's why my T 
sell nonprofit, uh, does the virtual internships uh, for, um, for underrepresented youth. And we start much earlier with them in, in high school. Uh, and so the second thing about that is that given the structural racism that has played a significant role in shaping those policies that have actually spawned the widespread health inequities, the leaders, at the federal, the state, and the local government level should re-examine existing laws and regulations for their impact on people of color's access to quality care. And that uh, this is uh, an excerpt from a community, uh, I'm sorry, a Commonwealth Fund report. And it also talked about the new reforms uh, that are needed to ensure good insurance coverage, to ensure timely access to primary, and specialty care needs, and that it should target communities across the United States that have long been ignored. So the healthcare providers and the institutions have to assure that health equity is advancing for everyone. And the truth is that um, you know the what I call the re-traumatization. When you look at at um, this slide, looking at the widespread impact of trauma, understanding the pathways for recovery, understanding the signs and symptoms, and uh, knowing when to develop a comprehensive uh, program is critical. And so all those things I just shared go into that. But this other piece about preventing re-traumatization is something that is in the power of folks working in the healthcare system to do right now to address health inequities, especially when it comes to um, uh, helping uh, primarily Black and Hispanic uh, patients who are still uh, experiencing the most disparities. Um, and even some of the work that I've done as a consultant working uh, with uh, doing focus groups across the health ecosystem. And for example, in the, uh, in the ER rooms, in the hospital uh, hospitals for, for people of color uh, can be a very negative experience. Um, I've heard C-suite level folks, CEOs talk about having to learn the hard way if they are diverse, if they're black, especially, uh, that if they have to take their child to the emergency room, they know that they have to dress up. They got to put on makeup, make sure their hair is safe. Even though your child is sick and you're trying to get them, that you've got to, you know, carry a nice bag if you have one. But the, otherwise, when you don't do that, you sit in those emergency rooms in hospitals across this country, neglected and uh, being left to sit for hours. So uh, that's huge. The other piece is the fear or the discomfort of diversity by non-diverse workers, especially those coming from states without a lot of diversity. Uh, and so, you know, I heard things from the employees like when a black family's loved one dies and people get emotional, um, you know, the non-diverse nurses will call security or even call the police um, because they are afraid, uh, you know, and not comfortable around diversity. But when a white family's loved one dies, the nurses will sit with them and hold their hand. So these are things you and your organization, if you work in a healthcare system, you can help with these things. You can do the inclusive leadership work. You can do the cultural sensitivity uh, work and there, so, so because what is really needed is for cultural immersions by physicians and others that are responsible for providing equitable care. AAMC did a study in December, 2020, that found that white physicians who did their medical training at, his, at hospitals affiliated with historically black colleges and universities actually provided more culturally sensitive and appropriate care than those who did not. So we definitely, uh, those are things that can be addressed and, and doing the uh, cultural immersion programs are huge. And that is something where you de do see the integration of the diversity and inclusion work with your health equity work, um, with the inclusive leadership workshop that you heard referenced earlier that I created, the, the part of creating these opportunities for leaders and staff to immerse themselves into other cultures different than their own is critical. And diversifying your personal network, that's stuff you can do, okay? If you're black and everybody in your personal network is black, that's a problem. If you're white and everybody in your personal network is white, it's a problem. If you're Asian and they're all Asian, if you're Hispanic and they're all Hispanic, if you're LGBTQ and they're all 
LGBTQ, if you're disabled, then they're all disabled. You have to immerse yourself into other cultures if you are really going to uh, provide culturally competent care and also help advance uh, health equity. Um, and so this slide just kind of breaks down the six principles of trauma-informed care. And I'm, I would hope that if you're already working in healthcare, you should be pretty familiar with these. Um, but I, I want to share it because it, as you look at, certainly um, people want to feel safe. They need the trustworthiness with the caregivers and the transparency of those that are taking care of them and their physicians and providers. They need peer support. They need collaboration and mutuality. Um, they need folks who understand cultural, historical, and gender issues. Uh, but this, this middle one, empowerment, voice, and choice, is a huge need when it comes to advancing health equity because I've heard repeatedly from, uh, from uh, diverse patients that the physicians and nurses don't listen to diverse patient concerns. And uh, as a black woman, I have experienced that myself. Um, I experienced my own trauma of losing my first child uh, at, at, to SID, sudden infant death syndrome at two months old. And so then when I finally was able to get past that trauma enough to get pregnant again, and it took some years, um, I was uh, very traumatized that when I went into labor, I started bleeding that did not happen with my first pregnancy. Um, and so I told the staff when I was admitted to uh, not Stanford, so don't y'all start looking at, okay. <laughs> it's a totally different state, but academic uh, medical center, very, um, you know, always on the best list and all of that. But nevertheless, I told them when I was admitted that I was bleeding and they just kind of waved it off. Oh, that's normal. I was put in a very plush, uh, you know, private room um, I was the only black patient there, uh, but then my husband and I were left there uh, for at least two hours uh, before anyone came back to check on me. And when a nurse finally kind of wandered in, so oh, I just want to see how far you dilated. And, you know, she rolls the, the stool up to the, you all in healthcare, so forgive me if I'm a little graphic, but anyway, she rolls the stool up and, and to the bed and she pulls back the cover to get ready to do it. And, and you, she didn't have a good poker face because her eyes got big as dimes and she started rolling away uh, from the bed, literally. Uh, and she said, I'll be right back. And she did come right back and she brought pretty much the whole floor with her, doctors, nurses, transporters, um, anesthesiologists. They started doing stuff right away. And next thing I know, they're literally running me down the hall um, to the um, operating room and uh, for an emergency C-section. Uh, my baby was John, born jaundiced. Um, I had to have a blood transfusion. I had lost so much blood. So needless to say, the re-traumatization was real. And if they would have just listened to me when I said I'm bleeding, I don't think this is normal uh, and paid attention or even come back to check on me. Uh, but these are the kinds of things. And we already know that the black maternal and infant morbidity rate is probably one of the biggest and most egregious indicators of health inequity. Uh, that Black women have faced with Black infant mortality being twice that of white infants and the, uh, the challenges that the mothers have and even with dying, the moms themselves dying. Uh, this is all happening to Black women more so than any other race. It's regardless, uh, you know, of, of any other race. It's regardless of their age, uh, their education level, their social economic, economic, socioeconomic status, or their geographic location. And even um, just again, as we are in the middle of Women's History Month, uh, Black women are dying 41% more than white women with the exact same types of cancer. So the disparities and the inequities are there. And I would just say that the going along with the empowerment and the voice and listening to your patients, having the cultural sensitivity and the humility to listen to them and hear them out instead of disregarding them. And it gets to choice, right? Um, so one of the other things that I was so surprised about as I've been doing all this focus group research over the last few years is when doing focus groups with specialists about potential new therapies or procedures, how many of them are just very clear that I am, you know, they're not going to offer this newest thing to their patient. They have no intention of letting the patient know 
about these newer therapies where the physician thinks it's too risky. And I understand about the physician's right to, to make that assessment. However, patients deserve to know their options and to not even give them the choice to know what's available. Um, I, I think that's a challenge. Type one diabetes um, is, is, is an example, a more recent example of some of the things I've seen where newer a newer treatment um, the endocrinologists are like, have no intention of, of uh, even talking to their patients about it. Um, but when we talk to the patients who have severe type one diabetes, they are, and this is focus group work, just want to make sure you're clear. Um, it, but they are like, bring it on. I can't live like this every 15 minutes looking at the you know, at the monitor at my CGM, if they even have a CGM, most black folks don't even have one. Um, but um, looking at that or waking up uh, with five paramedics all around me or not able to drive because I, you know, my blood sugar low. So um, the choice, don't take the choice away um, from the patients. You don't get to decide if they want to take the risk or not. You, 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 they deserve the right to know. I'm also surprised how the companies immediately assume uh, when you bring up servicing diverse patients that they that people immediately start talking about Medi-Cal, uh, even as you're talking about new treatments and services and and they go to Medi-Cal. And, um, you know, can I just say not all black people are on Medi-Cal. Uh, you know, we have black people who are fully insured, working jobs, financially doing well. Um, so your biases and your assumptions that you bring with you are just really, um, it, you're, you're advancing the health inequities. And so again, um, we need to understand and, and educate ourselves more to be culturally aware and uh, culturally competent. And that's why um, you see uh, some organizations um, you know, like Genentech, again, I hate to keep mentioning them, but they are ones who are, are doing pilots where they're getting away from the traditional uh, CROs who go to their same old sites all the time. Uh, they don't have the diversity of the staff um, and they are, are missing out on these pockets where you do have diverse folks, uh, again, who are well insured um, and, and able to participate in your trial. So they're doing stuff like in Mobile, Alabama and Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so again, make sure that uh, you're not making your own, uh, letting your own assumptions uh, cause you to take choice away from your patients. Um, now, the um, I mentioned previously that we had Dr. Janet Woodcock uh, at our Real Health Equity Summit and Dr. James Hildreth, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College, did a fireside chat with her. And one of the questions we asked her was, what do you see as the FDA's role in advancing health equity? And she had three very specific things. One was that they are focusing on assuring the FDA's workforce is representative of the demographics of the US. That is something that everyone can do to help advance uh, health equity, but you gotta take it serious. You gotta be intentional about it with your hiring practices. Um, and uh, we've also um, assuring clinical trials are representative of the demographics of the US and of the populations most impacted by the disease. Uh, that is uh, very critical. And uh, that's why, as I said, breaking out of the traditional trial sites and investigators for clinical trial recruitment is critical if we're going to advance health equity, if we're going to advance personalized health, if we're going to achieve precision medicine, uh, and if we're going to do more to diversify the human genome database. Um, and uh, I think you all heard Dr. Uh, Pazdur, uh, these, these substitutes for diversifying clinical trials, like doing phase four studies and what have you, uh, we just saw that play out when the FDA did not accept a trial uh, that had only been done in China. And he highlighted several reasons for changing his mind. He believes that data derived entirely from a single foreign country, and it's usually China most often, makes a, marks a step back from efforts championed by the FDA and drug makers to increase the racial and ethnic diversity of clinical trial participants. Um, and uh, he said that the um, Chinese data are not generalizable 
to American cancer patients and do not fulfill on unmet medical need in the US. Um, uh, and then the other thing is assuring that the newest innovative therapies and treatments are offered to diverse patients. And we are seeing this play out in sickle cell disease where Dr. Ted Love, who you saw on the, um, who was at the summit, talked about how his organization did everything they needed to do to get their new innovative sickle cell treatment, and, uh, an area that hasn't had a new innovative treatment in years, uh, got it through the, the clinical trials, through the FDA priority review, actually approval, and got it on the market only to find that the hematologists are not prescribing it to their sickle cell patients. They're opting to give them basically the current standard of care, which among other things is just pain medication, and they're treating now, the adult sickle cell patients like drug addicts, uh, it, it is a horrible situation. And these are things that organizations should be paying attention to. And what, how are you holding your, your physicians, your specialists, and others accountable uh, when they're making these decisions about who gets the newer therapies and who doesn't? Well, the FDA is going to uh, start tracking that themselves. And I'm very excited to hear that. All right, going to my next slide. I know I'm moving quickly, but I want to allow time for Q&A. Um, so there is an opportunity to provide culturally competent care to patients by matching them with doctors who identify as the same race or ethnicity. This was a, uh, their uh, annual big survey that Anthem does, um, and over 5,000 folks are surveyed. And uh, a very, as you can see, uh, a great demographic mix. But it was interesting that uh, this is the metric of I receive better medical care when the doctor is of my race or ethnicity. And you will see 33% of uh, white people felt that way, 62% of black, Hispanic, and Latino, and uh, I'm sorry, and black, yeah, 62% of both uh, felt that way, and 60% of Asian uh, patients felt that way. So um, there is something to be said for uh, making sure that we are investing in um, diverse uh, physicians. And uh, Fierce Pharma just reported that in academic and community hospital settings in the US, white personnel comprise a whopping 68% of the staff and the number is lower in private practice, but still 56% white. And that's why you see organizations like, uh, all different organizations, but certainly in our uh, field, Novartis and Abbott and others are uh, allocating all these funds to create more research centers like Novartis is creating three more research centers at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Abbott is doing an effort with the historically black colleges and universities um, that have medical centers. And I think it's great let me just say, I think it's great that people are doing that, but you know there's only four, right? HBCUs, uh, there are only four of them. So the other academic institutions have got to step it up. Those four can only produce so much. They're only endowed uh, so much. And so um, other academic institutions have got to step it up. You've got to hire a diverse workforce and you've got to figure out how to keep them how to build an inclusive culture so that they stay because we know that they come, but the culture is such that they don't stay. So um, this is something where that you can do that's tangible to help address health inequities. The patients are saying themselves uh, what they feel. Um, and then also this easy access to high quality primary, primary care doctors. Um, these are areas that the patients feel are very important. These are kind of the top social determinants of health that Americans believe the nation uh, should solve. So having easy access to quality primary care providers is actually number one, along with financial stability. And then safety is the third one. Um, but people trust their primary care physicians, as I said. So uh, you know, a question and challenge to all healthcare institutions, can we do more in the primary care settings to move the needle to advance health equity? And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Megan Mahoney, uh, who did a LinkedIn Live with me and also participated in our health equity summit. Um, you know, when I was at Stanford, um, they were just finishing up their human wide pilot. It was a great example of an approach uh, that could help advance 
health equity, um, and uh, it was a primary care-based model that incorporated uh, the genetic counseling, the coaching, um, uh, and uh, as well as digital um, uh, wearables. Uh, and um, it, so, you know, it worked really well. So that's an example, though, um, of things that we need to do more pilots like that and test some other um, solutions. And then people were asked, who do they think are responsible to address social determinants of health uh, and health disparities? And overwhelmingly, top of the list, healthcare providers. Um, people are more likely to hold the healthcare providers responsible for addressing social determinants of health and health inequalities and the disparities. And then they go to government um, and others. Um, academia is actually at the bottom of the list, but still, these are pretty high percentages. 75% believe it's academia. And then, of course, community organizations. Four and five Americans across all regions believe health insurance companies are responsible for addressing social determinants of health and health disparities. Um, so these are all things that we people are speaking up. They're being asked, and uh, we know that um, these are things that we should start looking at. And again, these intersectional type partnerships to make these things happen are critical. So this was a slide, it's kind of an eye chart, but just wanted to pull together some of the pain points with targeted inclusion and health equity solutions uh, that um, we think are, are viable. So certainly understanding the business and societal value of health equity, uh, as I uh, hope to point out to you, the bias exists all the way across. And what that means is we're leaving billions of dollars on the table by not ensuring that all patients that can benefit from our health uh, systems, our health innovations, our newest therapies uh, that could benefit from that will actually benefit. So we need to look at that. We need to root out the bias across all those uh, processes, and we need to make sure we're offering innovation to all the patients. We've got to solve healthcare's talent crisis by future-proofing the healthcare workforce. And it was interesting during the summit, Dr. Joy Career Perry talked about the reason that you're not seeing uh, the investment and the focus on developing Black youth, for example, um, for the future workforce is that when people look at a Black child, they don't see a physician. They don't see a scientist or a CEO or a geneticist. When they look at a Black child, they see a gangbanger. They see uh, you know, a criminal. They see a blue collar worker. We have got to change our own frame, our own minds. We have got to rethink and reprogram our own selves to break the bias that we all have uh, when it comes to how we see people and especially the future generations. And as I've said, people most trust people who look like them. I don't care if you're white, black, whatever, you trust people who look like you. Um, and so we need to recognize that and honor that with how we are creating our workforce. And as I said, we need these non-traditional partnerships earlier in the education process to develop the pipeline. We also have to hold physicians of all races accountable. Um, when we are doing things like equitable patient journey mapping, when we've got to, uh, you know, we've got to address the structural racism that lacks empathy. Um, and we've got a mandate that the newest innovations are made available to uh, BIPOC, to uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We've got to develop intersectional community first partnerships with advocacy groups, with community-based organizations. And by the way, these partnerships have got to be mutually beneficial and accretive partnerships. We heard from a lot of the uh, physicians, uh, not physicians, but the um, community leaders and pastors and others who were very involved in uh, Operation Warp Speed and um, decentralizing that whole process to engage more Black people. I have a quick case study that I'm going to share with you um, about that. And we heard from them um, that they, uh, you know, they helped with the testing, uh, with the vaccines, and they know that those companies were paid for that. Um, but none of those funds were accreted back to the community. They, we, we welcomed them, they came, we worked with them, and then we saw them leave and leave us in the same shape as they found us. Um, we've got to address misinformation. It's a two-way street. Stop putting the health literacy onus only on the patients. We have to become uh, more uh, culturally literate. We've got to shift and stop misrepresenting Tuskegee 
uh, the research has found that when you present to Black people um, the, um, the data, the science, the information, especially if it's people who look like them about the benefits of participating in a clinical trial and the value they're going to bring to other people, they will participate in the trial. Strengthen primary care and improve service delivery, shift from diversity in clinical trials to equitable clinical trials, and then um, address and find the digital solutions across the health ecosystem. Um, the health equity investments are huge. We had a whole section on health equity venture, and the goal there is to make sure you're investing in uh, funds that are being led uh, by Black, Latinx, and Asian uh, venture firms. These are all the companies that are uh, focusing on health equity. Um, this was our Black Coalition Against COVID. This is a case study. Just wanted to share very quickly. Uh, this was a pro bono campaign that Real Chemistry did in partnership with all these organizations you see here um, at the bottom. Um, but what we did was to focus on increasing vaccine uh, confidence and um, among Black Americans. And um, we, this was very much focused based on health outcomes to save Black lives, addressing the barriers, driving equitable innovation from bench to bedside. So we started first with this core uh, group of bringing together a network of trustworthy Black institutions to be at the center of the discussion, the action, and developing the strategy. Worked with all four of the colleges, Meharry, Morehouse, Howard, um, all of these, uh, the, the Black medical schools. Uh, we also uh, were very careful to work with the National Medical Association, blackdoctors.org, uh, the NAACP, the Urban League, um, created this Black Health Consortium. We actually had the Black American community, what we call the beloved community was here at the center. Then we had the Black Health Consortium. Then we had all the Black civic, social, faith, and community organizations that I just mentioned, like the NAACP and others. Then we worked with the federal government, the Biden administration and the White House were very involved, the CDC, um, HHS, and then with other COVID and health equity committed companies and organizations. Interestingly, uh, some of the pharma companies felt they belong closer here, uh, but we really, uh, you know, at the core, we needed the trustworthy, committed Black experts driving the strategy. Uh, these were preeminent experts. Um, that we're doing this didn't put the interests of, you know, a Kaiser Permanente or Anthem or any of these others at the center, but the beloved community. Um, and uh, the point is that this is not a one size fits all process. Um, and each diverse community is different. So you can't take something created in English and just translate it to Spanish, for example, and think you've created health equity or inclusion when we know that the Mexican cultural norms are different than the Puerto Rican, which are not the same as the Cuban. So we have to let people who look like the community drive how we address um, community needs and solutions. And this is just real quick, some of the, um, uh, the approaches that we took uh, the, the strategies that we took, it was very much empathetic, scientifically accurate um, approaches that we took to doing this work. The outcomes was that the power of the BCAC at the national level shifted the COVID inequities narrative to one of building credibility in the Black community about the innovative tests and the vaccines. Uh, the power of this approach, for example, at the local level, we're able to vaccinate just one example 900 people in one day in a health and food desert community that had lagged behind every other community in the Washington DC area, even though this was a national campaign. Um, and then the other thing is that we address the misinformation. So we did things like black doctors read COVID tweets um, to answer questions like, how did we get a vaccine faster than we got the next Rihanna album? <laughs> because it happened so fast uh, and that uh, impacted trust. Uh, with people. So it was also not talking down to people, but talking to them in relatable ways that are respectful and cognizant of their culture and also hearing them. So I just want to play this summary uh, video of um, uh, highlighting. The And one of the things that keeps me up um, and constantly working is this notion of health equity being more than just a moment. Because we can't just do uh, things differently. We've got to do different things. We need bold, committed, ethical, compassionate, and competent leadership that can harness organizational power to move us from rhetoric to real 
implementable and sustainable solutions. And so that is why we are here today. Clearly, clinical trial results don't reflect real-world demographics. And clearly, medical advances that don't reach everybody are simply just not impactful as they could be, as they should be. My description of it was the pandemic after the pandemic. And I think uh, it's something that we're going to have to work really closely over the next five to 10 years in particular. We are really challenging ourselves to think outside of the box. Because I believe clinical research is part of clinical care. And I believe that people deserve to have access to clinical trials, which may provide some cutting edge therapies for their disease. This is our business. <laughs> they don't truly really understand that. And it's like, if you're, if you're in the patient business, then this is your business. And you have to understand all of the different components of health equity. Because our mission, of course, is to make the world a healthier place. You can't make the world a healthier place unless people are healthy. Um, to begin with, economically, you know, it, it has a positive impact if people are healthy and they're living in healthy environments. But it comes back, really, to being intentional and understanding the power of application of knowledge, but also the commitment to solve a problem. Just think about how you integrate equity into your actual policies and practices so that people don't even know that they're actually uh, addressing uh, health equity. What if? Y'all know a lot of good ideas start with a what if. And then when you notice and recognize and realize that there is an injustice within your institution, how are you going to shift and um, resources and power, money, um, and people um, really according to need? And so, folks, if you really want to start doing, from my perspective, um, in equity or equity work, it's really understanding what the strategy of equity actually really means beyond the words of it. Yeah, no real change has happened without bravery. All right. That's it for me. I'm going to stop there. I know we are out of time, um, but I hope uh, this has been helpful. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah, to say the least, um, uh, Mary, thank you so much. Um, I am inspired and I'd imagine uh, everyone uh, here is inspired as well. You know, this has been enlightening, uh, moving um, and practical. You know, I think uh, you not only advanced our learning and you certainly did that in such a profound way, uh, but there were a number of call actions that you sort of weaved in there that uh, I also appreciate. Um, so we uh, just have a few minutes, uh, but there have only been a couple of questions that are coming to the uh, Q&A uh, so far. And maybe we can go, if it's OK with you, Mary, one or two minutes over. Um, so I want to, I'll start with the first question. And I don't know if Magalie is able to um, stay around to follow up with the second uh, question. And this one came into chat. Uh, and the, the comment says, excellent presentation. We got a lot of that, uh, Mary. Uh, related to what you mentioned uh, regarding future proofing your workforce, okay, could you or the panelists speak to how medical schools are addressing physician training on structural racism in healthcare, on health equity, uh, especially for perinatal care for Black mothers during schooling? The U.S., uh, as you mentioned, uh, still has the worst and rising maternal morbid morbidity and mortality rates in all developed countries. Understanding Black mothers are severely disproportionately affected. Uh, what is Stanford School of Medicine doing, which I might be able to address briefly, uh, but what are others doing to address this issue, Mary, and uh, what should we be doing? Yeah. So um, a lot of the organizations I've been working with are amplifying their, uh, their anti-racism training and creating specific programs around that. Um, and they have, uh, they're identifying champions within the various uh, arms of their medical schools to lead that work and to make sure 
um, that it's available, but, but the other piece is tracking and making sure that the physicians are actually taking it um, and that the, um, you know, holding faculty accountable. So, you know, the interesting thing with this new generation of medical students, and I would certainly say in the last couple of years, where folks are speaking out when they are experiencing the bias and the microaggression, when they are not being heard, not being called upon, not being given credit for their work in the medical schools, uh, not being included. Um, that is being called out more. And so the organizations are holding themselves and their staff who are accountable for not only the acquisition of talent, but actually the inclusion uh, to make sure that they are creating these programs and making them available. So the anti-racism training, the cultural immersion training, things like the inclusive leadership workshops that I do, those are becoming uh, more and more popular uh, where they have action items that go with them. And I wanna make sure people understand that because Harvard Business Review did an article about why diversity trainings don't work because people mad because you're making them take a training. Uh, but secondly, uh, there's no accountability. It becomes a check the box that, okay, I took it, leave me alone. But no one is checking back to say, are you putting into practice what you heard? Oh. So the new pro, so like the inclusive leadership workshop, no, there is a action plan accountability piece that carries on permanently throughout to make sure you're modeling the behaviors, you're practicing them and you're being held accountable and you're cascading it down throughout your entire organization to everyone who manages a headcount and then eventually to those who are, are not managers but just members of the staff. So those are some of the things that people are doing. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for that response. And I, uh, Terrence has put a response in the chat for the question that was specific to uh, Stanford Medicine's role in the process as well. So, so we can take a look at that. Um, I know we are one or two minutes over. So actually at this point, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Dr. Daryl Oaks to close us out. But I just wanna thank you, Mary Stutz, from the bottom of my heart and really my head too. I feel like I've been learning so much today and, and really I do have this call to action now to, to, to continue to move this work forward. So thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wow, what a just powerful you know sort of presentation, and also just to remind us that these are these are these things require us to to move in out of our comfort zones and to create actionable change. So thank you so much. I I, I want to uh, also thank uh, the audience for participating in this program, and really excited about this joint venture. And also want to invite you uh, to continue this conversation in May. May 19th will be our summit um, and we'll be having a number of excellent leaders and programs that are working in the space share their thoughts and ideas and for a really powerful discussion. So please join us um, uh, for our summit May 19th and uh, really would uh, want to just keep this conversation going. So thank you, Mary Stutz, and thank you, uh, Terrence, and thank you, Magali, um, for partnering on this wonderful project. Have a good day, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs>